a one tank trip from the Washington DC area will bring you here to Fort Monroe in Hampton Roads, Virginia, to the location of one of the most significant events in the history of African-Americans in this country. Right here in 1619, Africans first stepped foot on these shores in Virginia and possibly in America as a whole. Wasn't Fort Monroe at the time, it was a place called Point Comfort. I can only imagine what must have been going through their minds. I can only imagine what it must feel like to be taken from your family and your home and your lands and your people. They were bound and taken by a Spanish slave ship named the Juan Batista. Against their will, they were headed to a Spanish colony named Veracruz. But they were intercepted on the high seas by pirates. And these 20 or so Africans that landed here were taken on a ship named the White Lion and brought, and they made landfall here at Point Comfort in Virginia, where they were traded for goods and supplies. And for the next 300 years, Africans will be brought against their will to these shores and others to be abused, to be driven, to be worked, to be beat, to be raped, to be used in any manner of way that their captors saw fit. Remember, the definition of slavery is absolute power after another or over another. And you can only imagine what horrific possibilities that would bring. These Africans had to find a way to survive. They had to find a way to live so that their descendants might see a better day. This is part of their story. Okay. 300 years later, it is now 1860, and in November of that year, a man named Abraham Lincoln is elected the 16th president of the United States. He is a member of a political party that is against slavery. And by December of that same year, South Carolina, followed by six other states, secede from the Union. And then by January of 1861, the Confederate States of America are formed. This is a separate country. They elected their own president and Congress and cabinet. They printed their own money. As far as they were concerned, they were a separate country. In April of 1861, Fort Sumter in South Carolina was attacked by Confederate troops and now the Civil War, which everyone knew was coming, has officially begun. President Lincoln calls for volunteers to raise a militia to deal with this insurrection. And at that, four additional states, including Virginia, also secede from the Union. In the same year and in the same month, in April, there are three enslaved men. Their names are Shepard Mallory, James Townsend, and Frank Baker. They're taken by their enslaver and brought to Hampton Roads, Virginia, not far from Fort Monroe, but on the other side of the waterway at a place called Sewell's Point. They're put to work building fortifications for the Confederate Army. They want to build an artillery battery so that they, they, the Confederates, will have some chance of regulating and um, controlling the shipping that comes in and out of Hampton Roads, Virginia, a major waterway. A man named General Butler, he is Major General Benjamin Butler of the Union Army. He had served in various capacities but without much success, at least on the battlefield. He was not the best battlefield commander and the engagements that he led, if you look at history, will show that. 
you might say that his battlefield resume wasn't exactly glowing, but General Butler is a lawyer by trade and he had a quick wit concerning matters of the law. He arrived to take command of Fort Monroe on May 20th, 1861. Fort Monroe was the only, or I dare say the last bastion of the Union presence in the South, which is what Hampton, Virginia was, the South. It was a strategic position on the Hampton Roads waterway, and it was advantageous for the Union to keep control of it. General Butler does not know the dilemma that he will face in just two days' time. This is Fort Monroe on Hampton Roads, Virginia. Note the high walls with the berm on top, the points of entry, the moat that surrounds it. This is a fortress in every way. This would be the last bastion of the Union Army in the South and the first hope of the escaped slave. This would be the beginning of the end of slavery in this country. A fortress. Look how thick the walls are. Thick enough to sustain any cannon fire from any direction. This was a fortress in every way. And at this location would be the first step on the beginning of the end. These three men who are working at Sewell's Point, working on this Confederate artillery entrenchment, Shepherd Frank and James, have hatched a plan to escape. They've been working by day and planning by night. Their plan is to escape across the open waters of Hampton Roads from Sewell's Point to a place north and east to Fort Monroe. Their plan is to take a rowboat and to row across this two mile stretch of open water, which is nothing to sneeze at depending on what the winds and the tides are doing. They've discovered that their enslaver intends to send them further south into North Carolina and possibly away from their families permanently. Now, Virginia has just ratified its secession from the Union, and they did it with these words. The powers granted under the Constitution are derived from the people, and the federal government has perverted these powers, not only to the injury of the people of Virginia, but also to the oppression of slaveholding states. Now, can we just say, you hear a lot about the Civil War being fought for states' rights, which is smoke and mirrors. The Civil, right, the Civil War was fought over slavery over states wanting to keep their slaves, to keep people in bondage, to keep people working for free. That's what the Civil War is about. And every state that seceded from the Union has something in their secession papers stating that. In fact, the vice president of the Confederacy, a man named Alexander Stevens, wrote in the Confederacy secession documents, the cornerstone of the Confederacy is simply this. The Negro is not equal to the white man, period. Now it's May 23rd, the day of celebration in Virginia. Virginia has seceded from the Union. Shepard, Frank, and James decide this is the day to make their move. Probably because, you know, when people celebrate they get a little tipsy. They may have a little bit to drink or whatever. They may not be as, as observant as they would be. So that night, they make their move across the sound, across the open waters of Hampton Roads to Fort Monroe. That's their destination. And they probably used the Point Comfort Lighthouse as a directional beacon because after all, at night on open waters, you can't see anything and you cannot detect which way you are going without some kind of navigational beacon. So they probably used the Point 
comfort lighthouse as a directional beacon. They arrive at Fort Monroe two days after General Butler has taken command of it. Now, in those early days of war, things were a little bit different than what perhaps you think about war. Men took pride in being gentlemen and being ambassadors, especially the officer cadre. And I say all that to say that it wasn't unusual for the Union Army to return escaped enslaved persons to the South, to their captors. Uh, the Union Army just did not have a plan or an, an edict to free enslaved persons on the battlefield during the war. They just didn't. So a few days after these three gentlemen show up at Fort Monroe, a Confederate officer shows up at Fort Monroe under the flag of truce, proclaiming that he is the agent of an officer at Sewell's Point. Remember, that's where they were working. And he has been dispatched to retrieve these enslaved men and bring them back. This was common in that day and time, but that was about to change. Now, these three guys have made their way to Fort Monroe. And like I said, they arrived just a few days after General Butler has taken command. Now, General Butler was not an abolitionist. He was not, but he was a shrewd lawyer and a general in the Union Army at war against the Confederates. He knew that these men would be used to go and fortify positions and create whatever the Confederate Army needed. They would be manpower, and General Butler wanted to prevent that from happening, so he thought about it. And he considered the law and everything that he had according to what was going on in the day and time, as far as information. After much consideration, he told this officer, this Confederate officer, who had simply strolled up to Fort Monroe and knocked on the door. He told him that he would, in fact, not be returning these men, that they were contraband, according to the rules of war, and that furthermore, since Virginia, was no longer a part of the Union and was in fact another country, he had no reason to honor the Fugitive Slave Act or any other legal instrument that set down as a federal law from the Union from which Virginia and all other states that seceded had declared their association with henceforth dissolved. So these formerly enslaved men became known as contrabands. In other words, just like anything else that an army at war captures, it is not then beholden to give back or return. General Butler didn't know it, but he had made a decision that would change the course of history. So before long, enslaved persons began to flock to Fort Monroe in droves. In just one month, more than 500 people arrived. And you can see why. I mean, the walls were tall and thick. There's a moat that goes all the way around it. There's heavy doors. It is a fortress. And not just at Fort Monroe, but all across the country, word got around that you could flee into the lines of the Union Army, you would be considered contraband and you would be freed from your enslaver. Uh, General Butler had not counted on this. And this was the beginning of the end of slavery. There are the unintended consequences of a thing. Systems thinking teaches us that there's always your intended result and an unintended result as well. General Butler didn't know that the word was going to get around so fast 
and that people would be flocking to Fort Monroe after these three men were not returned. But that's how it happens. Word gets around. And before long, all over the country, enslaved persons were fleeing into Union Army lines to be considered as contraband. So many that the Union Army had to begin to set up and establish camps. They called them contraband camps because the people needed a place to live. They needed a place to lay their head. I mean, really, you're enslaved on Sunday and you're free on Monday. You have to have some semblance of somewhere to, to live and exist while things are going forward, things are being worked out. I have a personal connection with one such occurrence, by the way. And the picture that I am showing you now, it's a picture taken by Timothy O'Sullivan. He is a National Geographic photographer. It shows us enslaved persons who are seen with the Union Army crossing the Rappahannock River at a place called Freedman's Ford, which is in Remington, Virginia. This location is a stone's throw away from a church that I served as pastor for more than 10 years. In fact, we had a river baptism there. The symbolism could not be thicker. You cannot make a Hollywood script any better than this. I knew about the location at the time and we had the baptism there and the symbolism was such that a hundred years before, whenever that was, you had these enslaved persons that were in the water seeking to be free. And on that day we had the baptism, we had spiritually speaking the same thing. Now these contraband camps, they were set up everywhere. And in fact, anytime you see a place named Freeman's anything, more than most likely it started out as a contraband camp. Now, the contraband camps were not an ideal solution, but no solution ever is. I mean, there was hunger and disease and all number, all manner of illnesses. I mean, you got to realize these are camps, they're temporary camps, and usually just tents. If, if they were that lucky, there was exposure to the elements and um, anything else that you can imagine that will happen in a place with no infrastructure. But it was part of the beginning of the end of slavery in this country. A seemingly innocuous move on the part of a Union Army general with a resume that wasn't that strong, who had no intention of dealing a blow to end slavery. But that is exactly what he did. Listen, General Butler, with that decision, freed more slaves than any battle ever did. This put a knife in the idea that slaves are sedentary, passive, going along to get along, or even happy. Have you heard that one? And content to be enslaved, grateful to their enslavers. None of that is true. Slaves were courageous. They were resourceful. And when they took the chance to be free, when they had the chance, they took it. That's why so many contraband swelled the walls within Fort Monroe and all across the country. Enslaved persons were courageous. More than 200,000 men swelled the ranks of the Union Army when they were given the opportunity to fight. And they fought for their freedom, let's be clear. They fought for no ideology. They fought for no glorious moment. They didn't want to go back home and be able to tell war stories. They fought for their freedom. They fought for their ancestors, and they fought for their descendants. They fought for freedom. By the end of the war, more than 40,000 people had swelled the population of Washington, D.C. Contraband. They had made their way to D.C., and if there were that many in Washington, D.C., then you can extrapolate what it must have been like numbers wise across the rest of the country. In 1619, when these first Africans landed here at what was then Port Comfort, not knowing where they were, just realizing that they had to survive and lay whatever foundation they could for their descendants, that's what they did. Now, 
1819, 200 years later, their descendants, the descendants of these 20 or so Africans brought from what was modern, modern day Angola, their descendants began to lay the footers and the foundation for Fort Monroe. They had no idea that they were in fact building a bastion of freedom for those that will follow, for their descendants, for their descendants who will come in droves as contraband. But they built, they were enslaved, they didn't have a choice, but they built that foundation for their descendants, not even knowing. My question to us sometimes is what are we building for our descendants? But if you take a look at the irony of this story, the first Africans were brought here in 1619 to be enslaved. And then 300 years later, Major General Benjamin Butler with a decision that he thought was simply a resource grab was the first step of many in freeing enslaved persons in this country. I would encourage you to come down to Fort Monroe. It's a three hours drive from Washington, DC. Take a look around, walk around, look at the wildlife, look at the way, look at the waves, look at the, the, the walls of the fort. It's amazing to see what these enslaved persons built. And you will be a little bit closer perhaps to your ancestors and you'll be in the same space where this historic event occur. Truth be told, you can find African-American history anywhere because our history is everywhere. See you again real soon, my friends. If you would like to see more videos like this, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to receive our new releases. If you would like to assist Truth Be Told in our mission to preserve African-American history, which is American history, please share this video with your children, family, and friends. Truth Be Told, you can find Black history anywhere because our history is everywhere.